All right. Hello again, everyone. Um, for those of you who were here last week, you remember, hopefully you remember me. I'm Jason. So let's just dive into the test. All right. So, oh, by the way, um, if anyone has any like requests in terms of questions they want to go over, um, just type them in the chat. Uh, if it's a later question, I probably will not get to it till, until the end because I'm going to try and hit like the earlier questions first. But if you have one where you're just like, Jason, please, I have no idea what's happening, type it into the chat and I'll see if we can get there. All right. Um, and specify calc or no calc. Uh, all right. So one. So here, um, you know, very emblematic of the first question, um, you know, for those of you who were last week, the questions, you know, as you go from 1 to 15, then 16 through 20, the questions start off easy and get progressively more difficult until you hit question 15. The difficulty then resets at the beginning of the fill in the blank section in 16 and then progressively gets more difficult until 20. Um, so your earlier questions tend to be easier. Also worth noting, um, there's a little caveat on this now because the SAT recently just started um, sh shuffling the question order on people. So the basically the kid next to you is, while they'll have the same questions, um, they're not going to have them in the same order, um, which, you know, breaks standardization, but the SAT doesn't do a particularly good job of that anyway, you know, tutor rants. Um, but, um, so just be mindful of that. The order might be a little jumbled and, um, don't peek, uh, cause it won't be helpful. Um, but so number one is nice and easy. So number one is going to be, um, just, you know, straightforward algebra. It gives us an equation and all it does is asks us to solve for C. So, um, I strongly encourage you to do math on the page. Like, yes, you probably don't need a page to do this one. However, um, the amount of people who slip a digit um, when doing things in their head, you know, like, oh, I've added, you know, nine and eight and gotten 19. It, just, it happens all the time. Um, so please do the things on the page. Um, there's no it's bad to get something wrong because you got cocky about it. Uh, the deal I cut with my students is, uh, you know, once you start scoring over a 700, that's when you're allowed to do mental math. So we have 2z plus 1 is equal to z minus z. It's ugly. 2z plus 1 is equal to z. So minus z minus z, minus one, minus one, z's cancel, one's cancel, z is equal to negative one, there it is. All right, yeah, the, um, just like last week, I believe the first question we went over last week was also just please solve this algebra equation. You know, it's about as straightforward as you're gonna see on this test. So now next up is um, question number two. Uh, let's see what's going on here. Um, I think I heard your English tutor um, say it for the grammar section, but like always a good thing to do. Um, there's a certain rhythm and a certain pattern to the way these questions are asked. When you read the question, try and figure out what type of question it is that'll really help you get like this lens to see what's going on. Because, you know, if you're dealing with a similar triangle problem, there's like four tricks they use. That's it. Um, so if you identify similar triangles, hopefully your memory can get jogged and like, oh, okay, be aware of X, Y, and Z as I go through this. So let's identify this question. Uh, a television. A television with a price of $300 is to be purchased with an initial payment of $60 and weekly payments of $30. Um, which of the following equations can be used to find the number of weekly payments required to purchase, uh, to complete the purchase, assuming there are no taxes or fees? Okay, so this is one of those, and big air quotes, modeling reality questions, you know, for all those times you apply lines to your everyday life. Um, you have a question. 
Um, yes, you can plug in on number one. Um, as a matter of fact, I would actually encourage that on some of the harder ones. Uh, so someone, sorry, someone asked for questions like number one, if we plug in the answer choices, would it still lead us to the right answer? It absolutely would. And later on, there's actually some as the difficulty ramps up a little bit where I would encourage that. Um, my mind just skips straight to the algebra on question one because the algebra is just very, very straightforward. It's the path of least resistance on this one. So, um, but uh, yes, absolutely. That is a completely valid strategy um, for because it just asks you to solve the question. So it has to be, it has to work if you plug it in. All right, good question. Um, so now we have question number, so back to question number two. Um, right, so we have, um, so this is modeling reality, right? So whenever we're dealing with those modeling reality questions, here's how I want you to conceptualize y is equal to mx plus b, right? This is the equation of the line. Um, I find if you think about it in the way I'm about to tell you, it can really help you like, get where you need to go in terms of like, if I think about it this way, I will literally run into the answer because it will be expressed in similar terms. Um, so um, here's what's gonna happen here. Um, so if you think about in terms of B, right? B is going to be the uh, initial value, right? So um, this is where you start, you know, so if you're X, so um, you have your X, Y graph, um, this is going to be, you know, where you start on the graph, it's the Y intercept. So in my completely hypothetical example, um, let's say Jason is a test prep tutor. Um, and the way I bill is I build, you know, by the way, um, I wish these were the numbers, they are not. Um, let's say I chart, let's say the equation representing my salary was y is equal to 500x plus 100. So what this would actually mean is b would be 100. That would mean at minute zero, like it doesn't matter how long the lesson is, at minute zero, you owe me $100. That's the price for getting me to like open my door to leave my, to leave my apartment. Um, that is the fixed cost. This is the variable cost, right? But that's not a helpful way to think about it. Here's how I want you to conceptualize this number. That number is um, the change in X, uh, the change in Y rather. And I'm putting Y in quotes because I just literally want you to identify what Y is and read it into the question. So that is the change, and in this one, it would be cost per one X, and then read X in. So that 500 would represent the change in cost per one hour. Um, and you'll see, not, ne not necessarily this one, because this one's pretty straightforward, it's an earlier question, but on some of the later ones where there's a lot of moving pieces, that will almost get you directly to um, an answer choice. If it's, you know, if they're asking you, what does the slope represent? That will almost be exactly how it's phrased. So I find that a useful way of keeping track of what's going on. But back to the question actually at hand. Um, so here, do you see how it says with an initial, so a television with a price of $300 is to be purchased with an initial price of $60 and weekly payments of $30. Um, which of the following equations can be used to find the number of weekly payments required to complete the purchase, assuming there are no taxes or fees, right? So, um, all right, so this one's like fr it's phrased a little bit weirdly, but um, just because it's, you know, you have, um, because they've already basically filled in the Y for you, but um, in effect, what you have there is, imagine this is your chart, right? So um, our initial value is going to be, this is tracking how much money we're spending. So our initial value is going to be 60, right? It's not gonna be negative 60. We're not starting below the graph. It's just gonna be 60. So we're actually done, it's C, but like 
not the best way of going about it. Um, and then, so what's our variable cost? Well, here, um, W, $30 is the change. What $30 represents is um, the price left, which in this case would be $330 at the beginning, $300 at the beginning. Like I said, this is a little different because Y is already filled in for you per week, right? So effectively, this would go up, 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 up until you hit $300. Um, so C is the answer to question number two. All right. So um, the question number three. So here is what's going on with three. Um, all right. So by the way, whenever you see one of these charts, one thing to be mindful of is you can always just think X, Y. Um, typically, when you have one of these charts, you can just treat these as points on a graph and just do X, Y. That'll work out nicely for you. Um, so the table above shows shipping charges for an online retailer um, that sells sporting goods. There is a linear relationship between the shipping charge and the weight of the merchandise. All right, so literally it just told us it's a line. Great, we have points, we have a line, we see where this is going. Um, what function can be used to determine the total shipping charge in dollars for an order with a purchase weight of X pounds? All right, so, and then if we look at the answer choices, we can see this is just asking us to construct the line, right? So um, um, there's two ways of doing this. There is the full proper way, and then there's like the shortcut. So um, the shortcut here, and the shortcut works because it's question three. Um, I'll show you the shortcut first, and then I'll show you how you would actually do this if you got the question later on when it wasn't um, amenable to being cheated. But the, the real shortcut here is none of the B val like these B values are the same, but for the uh, this one and this one, the B values are just wildly different. If you take a look here, so as it went, it's linear, right? So the rate of change has to be constant. As you go from here to here, from 10 to 5, you go down like about 5, right? Well, then from 5 to 0, you should also go down about 5. So that would give you um, like 11-ish. Uh, no, sorry, uh, 21 minus uh, 60, 17, a uh, 12-ish. There we go. 12-ish, um, right? So, because that's, you know, 17 minus 5, 12. Um, well, if we look at our answer choices, um, when X is 0, this is the one that's 12. So B is just going to be our answer, right? Now, that's the cheaty face way of getting there. Um, that will not work on some of the harder questions. That works because this is towards the beginning and they like to put those things in towards the beginning. Here's how you would do it, though, if you couldn't cheat it like that. Um, so effectively, what we can think of these are as X and Y values, right? And here, um, now put this in your notes. You can get a shocking amount of mileage out of this concept um, and you really need to know it. Here is how you take two points and turn them into a line. So um, I'm just going to choose these points because um, they both end in a nine. Um, that'll make the subtraction easier. Eh, I could also choose that one. It eh, doesn't matter. Because um, also, these are not near each other. Um, so, you know, estimating is good enough for this one, which is, you know, good because it's the no calc section. But the first thing you do to take two points and turn them into a line is you find the slope. So the slope is gonna be the change in Y over the change in X. So um, I like to write out my points first so I don't do anything stupid. Um, so one of my points is gonna be 20 comma 31.79 XY. I always write in XY. Um, one thing you'll learn, and it's important that you do, and it's not like a sign of weakness, you literally watched me do it. Figure out what things you tend to make like little sloppy mistakes on and then figure out a way to fix them. So for example, you watched me write X, Y under a pair of coordinate, uh, under a, a pair of points, um, rather under, um, yeah, under, you know, the X, Y points. Um, that's because I get them backwards all the time if I don't do that. 
Have I done that in recent memory? No, because I figured out a way around it. But way back when, that was just something I would do every once in a while. I would just confuse the X and the Y. Um, haven't done that in years because I figured it out. Um, and then our other point will be 40 comma 51.59, right? So those are our two points, X, Y. So now um, to find the slope, it's just change in Y over change in X. So 51.59 minus 31.79. Um, and for the purposes of this, honestly, I'm just going to round that to 59. Um, these are not near each other, so we can figure out which one that is. Um, over 20, over 40 minus 20. So what that's going to give us is roughly 20 over 20. I'm putting the about equal sign because again, I kind of estimated the top, um, which will give us a slope of one, right? So now we know the slope. We're going to call the slope one. Yes, I know it's 0.99, but we're going to call it one. It doesn't matter in this example. So those, those answer choices are dead to us. Now, though, if we were trying to figure out the difference between those and it were perhaps a slightly harder problem, what we would now have is y is equal to 1x plus b, right? And we would need to figure out what b is to solve this equation. Well, we already have what x, y represent is any point on that line, right? So if we take a point on that line and plug it in, well, we should just be able to solve for B. Fortuitously, we have four points on that line. So let's use um, 5 comma 16.94 XY. Um, so 16.94 is equal to one times five plus B, um, 16.94 minus five is equal to B. B is about equal to 12. Um, yeah, those wavy lines. Um, yeah, my handwriting is atrocious on the tablet. Um, those wavy lines that were on purpose, it is the about equal sign to when you're estimating. Um, so, if you see that, that one's on purpose. It's the about equal to sign. Um, so yeah, that is how you would do this if it was a harder problem. And you really want to know that because that concept can come up multiple times a test. It's just when you have two points, you solve for the slope, put the slope in, take one of the points, plug it back into the question, it'll spit out the B value, and then you have everything you need to know for the line. Great. Any questions on that? All right, moving right along. Ah, more lines. Um, the line in the XY plane above represents the relationship between height in feet and the base diameter X. So by the way, when you see H of X, um, note H of X is Y. Like this part of the axes is what H of X equals to. This part of the axis, this axis is what X is. Um, for cylindrical Doric columns in ancient Greece architecture, how much greater is the height of a Doric column that has a base diameter of five feet than the height of a Doric column that has a base diameter of two feet? So um, the, the most straightforward way of doing this is to just get those numbers. Um, so if we go here, um, it says how much greater is the height for one that has a base diameter of five feet? Well, the base feet, the base diameter is X. So we go X up to five, 35, right? The height is 35. We go to two, we go all our way up. It is 14. So we have 14. That would be 21. C is the answer. Um, now, some of you might be thinking, but Jason, that seems so easy. Surely there's a trick. No, it's question number four. Question number four is going to be pretty straightforward. Um, don't, don't get fancy test syndrome. And don't uh, fancy test syndrome is what I call, you know, like, ah, oh, the SAT is a big old fancy test. I bet everything's complicated. Like, no, 
Things towards the beginning of the math section are straightforward. They may be hard if you don't know the concept, but they're not going to be tricky. Um, they're not, you know, playing hide the ball where they're like, ah, oh, take the answer and stick it behind their back. Um, so you can just, it'll be straightforward towards the beginning. Don't, don't get in your own head. All right. So now five. Five is just asking you to resolve this exponent. Um, really, the only way you can go wrong on this question is if you um, is if you forget to apply the square root to each part of this individually. So remember, if you have multiple things under a square root, it is like so. If you have nine x squared, that is actually uh, the equivalent to the square root of nine times the square root of x squared. These are the same thing. What you need to remember to do is take the square root of both. So this becomes three times x, a is the answer. Um, like I said, <laughs> don't get in your own head. Um, or, you know, as, uh, as our friend pointed out earlier, now, do you see these words? This says which of the following is equivalent to the given expression. Now, the algebra on this one was easy enough that, like, you know, I just did it. But let's say you're like, Jason, I have no idea what's happening. Can I get this problem right? Yes, you most certainly can. Um, whenever you see the words, whenever you see, like, equivalent expression, and you have one variable up here and one variable down there, you can just make up a value of x. Um, like, you can just let x be 2 and then solve. Um, um, what you do is you would plug in 2 here, right? So that would become the square root of 9 times 4. Um, 2 squared is 4, so the square root of 9 times 4, which is the square root of 36, which is 6, right? Well, if I plug 2 in here, I also get 6. Oh, they are equal. Right? So that's another way we can tell A is the answer. And note, if you plug 2 into any of the rest of these, you do not get back to 6. You get something else. And that's how plugging in on equivalent expression questions work. Um, I, I sometimes still use this um, on the harder ones where it's just, you know, they're like, oh, please understand to do synthetic division for this question. And just like, no, I don't have time for that. Uh, sorry, question at the end of the test. I'm just letting X be two and solving you very quickly, not the way the test makers wanted me to. Um, yeah, you don't get style points for doing it the way they want you to. So do it the way that works best. Um, so six, what are the values of X that satisfy the equation above? All right, two ways of doing this. One, just like on question one, we can literally plug in the answers, right? Um, if we plug in, um, we can plug in this and see if it's a true statement, right? So let's plug in negative three. Well, then we would have negative three squared, nine minus one divided by negative three minus one is equal to negative two. That would be eight over negative four is equal to negative two. Oh, that's a true statement, right? So we know that it can't be either of those. It's either A or D because negative three is a true value. Um, so now what we would do is we would plug in negative one and see if that works. So negative one squared is one. So you have one minus one up top. And we can actually stop. Um, if the top is zero, the whole thing is going to be zero, right? Like we're done here. We don't, we don't need to go any further. Negative one squared is positive one. So the top is zero. So we're not getting to negative two. Now that's the way you do it by plugging it in. The other way you can do this one is um, x squared minus one should look familiar to you. Um, and uh, this is a good test concept to have in the back of your mind. This is what's known as a difference of squares. So basically x squared minus one is equivalent to x plus one 
times x minus 1, right? This is the same way that x squared plus 4 is equivalent to x plus 2 times x minus 2. Basically, if this number is a perfect square right there, um, if you have x squared, um, sorry, not plus, <laughs> minus, because um, it's the difference of squares. If you ever have x squared minus a perfect square, it can be broken down into x plus the square root of it, x minus the square root of it. So here, we would have x plus 1 times x minus 1 over x minus 1 um, is equal to negative 2. Those cancel. x plus 1 is equal to negative 2. Um, x is equal to negative 3. Boom roasted. Those are the two ways you can do that. 7. Um, so we're dealing with a graph here. Um, we have an exponential function. Um, so if the graph of y is equal to f of x is shown in the xy plane, what is the value of f of zero? Okay, what this is really asking you to understand is what does f of x mean? Um, and realistically, what is that portion of it? So here's the way I conceptualize this. So f of x, is y at f of x is y at um, x, right? So if it's asking you for f of zero, it's asking you for y at the x coordinate of zero, right? That's all that means. If you have f of zero and this was like an actual equation where they gave you the numbers, you just take zero. You plug it in for the x values, and you see what answer it spits out. Um, in this case, it would spit out 4. You go to 0 and find the corresponding y coordinate. x is 4. All right, so now in the figure above, point B lies on AD. What is the value of 3x? So it's asking us to solve this. All right. So um, effectively what we have going on here is this is actually a pretty key piece of information. Um, this little box lets us know that that is 90 degrees. Now, AD is a straight line. On any straight line, there is 180 degrees. Great. So we know that if ADC is 90 degrees, then CBD, which isn't wholly made up of these, is also 90 degrees. So we know that 90 is going to be equal to x plus 2x plus 2x. So that is equal to 5x. Divide 5, 5. So 90 divided by 5 is, um, oh my goodness, I'm blanking, uh, 18. <laughs> Um, x is equal to 18. Oh, look, 18 is an answer choice. We're done, right? No, <laughs> no, we are not. Um, you'll notice I actually underlined it on my first pass, which is something I like to do. Um, they did not ask us to solve for x. They asked us to solve for 3x. That is C. Um, yeah. uh, one note on scale. Um, so the SAT is, you know, the graphs on the SAT are not drawn to scale. Um, what that means is don't bust out a protractor or ruler. Not only because that will get you kicked out of the room because you're not allowed to have those items, but um, they're not going to be helpful in terms of that. However, they're never going to draw something intentionally misleading. Um, one of the funniest ways I've ever seen someone solve a problem with side lengths was this girl like literally used her fingers as a little ruler <laughs> and determined how many finger lengths it was and converted it into the units by a proportion. It was hilarious and it 100% worked. Um, had she understood the math, she would have had an easier time. But, you know, if you get it right, you get it right. Um, the only thing 
that you should never ever assume is that something is 90 degrees. Um, if you don't, if it doesn't tell you it's 90 degrees, or if you don't see that little box, you cannot assume it's 90 degrees. Other than that, like you can kind of assume things are to scale. Um, they're not, they're trying to trick you. They're not trying to trick you that way. Um, and this is something that could not be said about the old version of the SAT, which gave you some disastrous graphs. Um, all right, so um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask if there's anything that like one of you wants to go over, particularly in the no calc. Um, we're not leaving the no calc if no one has anything they want to go over. I just want to um, perhaps spend a little time on one one of you found tricky. So I'm just going to give you a second to type into the chat if there's something in particular you would like to go over. All right, nothing in particular you want to go over. All right, I'm going to choose to interpret it that as that I'm such an excellent teacher. You guys are getting, you know, 800s on this section. That That is how I'm choosing to interpret that lack of feedback. <laughs> um, um, all right, so that's more, yeah, so that's a, all right, so someone responded. Um, I don't remember which numbers, but mostly right triangles. Okay. So let's see if we can find a right triangle one in this section. If it's not there, we'll go on. We'll, uh, we'll, well, if it's not in this section, we'll take a look in the next section and see if we can find one. Ah, here we go. Um, so is this the question you were talking about? Um, similar triangles? Okay. Yeah, so no problem. We can skip ahead to similar triangles. Similar triangles are a great topic for us to cover. They come up a lot. If you know what you're doing, they're not that bad. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to have a bad day. So, okay. Now this though is similar triangles mixed with a little trig um, because we have that cosine. Um, so I would actually almost say, you know, even if you know similar triangles, this is this is a trig question that requires you to understand how similar triangles work. So um, in the figure above, triangle ABC is similar to triangle DEF. What is the value of the cosine of A? So it, it just flat tells us they're similar. So what is true about similar triangles? The sides of the triangle are proportional. The angles are the same. That's what we know off the bat. Like there's going to be a ratio between this side to this side. That is also true from this side to this side. And all of the angles are congruent. Um, so here is, um, here is the entire course of trig as it relates to triangles in a nutshell. Um, side lengths are directly proportional to the size of the angle across from them. Thank you for attending my trig lecture. Um, everything else in triangle trig is kind of based on that. But um, here's how that would actually play out. Because the side lengths are proportional, right? So we have, so cosine of E is just going to be the same as the cosine of B. They're just going to be exactly the same. Because now, obviously, based on scale, this is not going to be twice the length of that. But let's say it was. So let's say this was 26, 24, 10, right? Well, um, and for everyone who just needs a little refresher, um, most of the trig you need to know is Sokotoa. That's like most of it. There's a little trig identity thrown in, but realistically, if you know Sokotoa, you'll be okay. So um, what does Sokotoa represent? Sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Um, cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Um, actually, so I don't know how well you guys know trig, but it's the sine of x is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine of x is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. And um, tan x 
is equal to opposite over adjacent, right? Those are our basic trig identities. Fortuitously, this test does not go into secant, cosecant, and cotan. Um, so you don't have to worry about those. Uh, the ACT people have to worry about those. You guys do not. Um, so, but let's take a look at what that would actually mean here, right? So the cosine for similar triangles would be opposite, or sorry, rather adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So the cosine of B would be 12 over 13, right? Um, adjacent side, hypotenuse. Well, the cosine of E would be um, 24 over 26, which is to say when reduced 12 over 13. Um, because the sides are proportional, trig functions on similar triangles will work, will be exactly the same. And that's what this one was testing. Um, and that's why the answer to 12 is B. Uh, do you have any other questions on that one, uh, Yusuf? Okay, great. Um, so um, I'm going to dedicate five more minutes to this section before we move on to the next one. Does anyone have any other question they would like to go over, or I'm just going to start talking again? Oh, thank you, Yusef. I think I explained it well, too. <laughs> um, you're very welcome. All right, so we're just going to do the problem I want to do. Um, we're going to do 15. So um, 15 is a conceptual line question. Um, there are three relationships that a line can have, two lines can have, right? In a systems of equations above, a is a constant. So what does that mean? That means A is some number. It is not a changing number. It just has some value. For which of the following values of A does the system have no solutions? Well, we have two lines, right? When you're dealing with two lines, there's only three possibilities in terms of the number of solutions. They can have one solution. That would be if they are two lines with um, different slopes. Um, yeah, if there are two lines with different slopes, they will have one solution. We can have inf we can have an infinite number of solutions when it's the same line twice. Um, you know, same slope, same y-intercept. And then we can have no solutions, which is two parallel lines. The lines will never intersect when they have the same slope, but different B values, right? So really what this is asking us is what value of A makes the slope of these two lines equal? That's all it's asking. Um, and by the way, you're going to want to have that, you know, in your memory bank as to um, what the three types of solutions are for lines. They don't do this every test, but they do it often enough that you're going to want to know it. Um, rather, they do it often enough, it is important that you know it. You want to know everything I'm telling you, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you it. Um, so how would I figure out what the slope needs to be for this? I'm just going to put it into y is equal to mx plus b form. So y is going to be equal to 3x plus 6 if I just add that 3 over. Cool. So I know the slope is 3. Now let's take this and put it into y is equal to mx plus b form. So we would have 2y is equal to negative a plus 4. Divide everything by 2. y is equal to negative a over two. Um, I switched to the capital letter because my A's absolutely look like nines. Um, y is equal to negative A over two plus two, right? So we know the slope is both three and negative A over two. So negative A over two is equal to three. Negative A is equal to six. A 
is equal to negative six. Conveniently, that is one of our answer choices and it is also the right answer. Um, so that is how you would do that one. Um, really what that relies on is just you understanding the relationship. Um, while we're on line things, um, let's just talk about perpendic perpendicular slope real fast. Um, so a perpendicular slope is the slope of a line that meets another line at a 90 degree angle. Um, so the way you find the perpendicular slope is the perpendicular slope is going to be the opposite reciprocal of a slope. What does that mean? All right, well, let's say our slope is three over two. The perpendicular slope would be the reciprocal, which is, means make it two over three, flip those, and then the opposite, negative two over three. Right. So um, they will usually, if you need to know that, they will usually just flat out ask you about the perpendicular line. They don't get too cute about they don't get cute about like how they ask you. The words perpendicular line will usually just come up or you'll see the two lines intersect at a 90 degree angle. If two lines intersect at a 90 degree angle, by definition, they are perpendicular. All right. Um, yeah, so um, 14, let's just have some fun with this real quick and then we'll move on to the next section. This is one of those ones where you need to be like a little bit careful, but uh, the strategy that, you know, remember the strategy I said um, here, I was asked about it, I said, yes, plugging in the answer choices will work. It just, you know, for this one, the algebra is pretty straightforward. Um, that will also work on this, which is now question 14. You just need to be a little careful when you plug in. So, you know, if we plugged in one, we would get the square root of four times one, which is just four, is equal to one minus three. Well, that would give us two is equal to negative two, right? That does not work. A is dead to us, C is dead to us. Um, now let's try nine. That's the square root of four times nine, which is 36, is equal to nine minus three, six, six. Okay, great. The answer is B. This is an example of a question where that actually makes it much, much easier. Um, because otherwise, it's not that it's like that hard to do it the other way, but other, if you do it the other way, you're squaring this side, and then you have x minus 3 squared, and you're just doing all sorts of algebra that you do not need to do. Um, so um, this is a great example of when plugging something in would just be a lot easier. All right, so now we're going to skip ahead to the calculator section. Um, we're going to start at the beginning and just start doing um, some questions. But again, if you have any question in particular that you would like to go over, please just type the number in the chat and I'll make sure we get there. Um, so a helicopter initially hovering 40 feet above the ground begins to gain altitude at a rate of 21 feet per second. Um, so do you see here how it says initially? Yeah, I, I glanced down. I can already tell this is one of those modeling reality questions. So our initial value is going to be 40. All right. Um, begins to gain altitude at a rate of 21 feet per second. Which of the following represents the altitude above the ground Y in feet T seconds after it begins its altitude, right? Well, so one, we know the initial value is 40, right? Okay, so this would have 40 being the variable value, right? This would have 40 being the rate of change. You're dead to me. Um, now, is if now, well, so we can actually kind of see, is this getting higher or lower? Because higher or lower will let us know if we can, if it's C or A or B. Um, and it begins to gain altitude. All right, well, this would be losing altitude. So that's dead to us. Now we have A and B. 
And the difference between A and B is the variable time T. Well, this is asking which of the functions represents the altitude in feet T seconds and it's gaining rate per second. So we absolutely need that variable in there. Um, this would just represent a line at um, 61, just going straight across at 61. Um, and like that, that would just not be doing anything. That would be if it was hovering at a constant thing. There's no change there. So the, our answer to one is B. By the way, so I realized I didn't stop for this. Does anyone have any questions on anything I've covered so far? All right. Um, a text message plan charges a, oh, right as I put it down. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Um, a text message plan charges a flat fee of $5 per month for up to 100 text messages sent plus 25, 25 cents for each additional text message. Oh, here I am seeing flat fee. That's my B value. Um, and that's for the first 100. Um, so for zero to 100, it's $5 plus 25 cents per each additional text. Which of the following represents the cost Y of sending X texts per month? By the way, I know this might sound ridiculous to you guys um, because at no point in your life was this type of thing true. However, when I was growing up, when text first became a thing, this is exactly how they charged you. Um, and my school was littered with kids who were grounded for racking up hundred dollar phone bills via texting. Um, you know, now the idea of charging per text just seems, you know, insane. Um, but this, this actually is how it used to work. Um, but so we have $5 for the first hundred text messages, right? Well, um, this one is not, if you take a look at C and D, this one is $5 for zero text messages, which is true, but it needs to be $5 all the way till 100, right? Because it said, so from zero texts to 100 texts, it's $5. Those are incorrect. Now, we have a line down from five and a line up from five. Well, what would a line down from five imply? A line down from five would imply that somehow it is costing less <laughs> after a hundred text messages. The, the total cost is being reduced. A is the answer. Three. Jake buys a bag of popcorn at a movie theater. He eats half the popcorn during the 15 minutes of the previews. Ain't that the truth on how people eat popcorn? <laughs> and by people, I mean Jason. Um, after eating half the popcorn, he stops eating for the next 30 minutes. All right, yeah, I could kind of tell this is going to be one of those, how is this line going to look? So for the first 15 minutes, he eats one half. Um, then he eats absolutely nothing for 30 minutes, and then he gradually eats. So we're going to have a pretty steep line down here. We're going to have a flat line from, from, the, from 15 to 45. Then he gradually eats the popcorn until he spills all of the remaining popcorn. So then we're going to have, let's actually just trace this out. So we're going to have a very steep line at first followed by no line. Then he's going to gradually eat it. So it is going to go down slightly. And then he spills it on the floor, which would just be a straight drop down. Oh, OK, B looks like our line. Um, is it B? Yes, it is. Excellent. Um, so yeah, so and you see, just by kind of like tracing out what it's telling us, we could see what was going on. Um, cause just all, all each part needed to be was congruent. The actual, um, the actual lengths of the things didn't matter. Just the proportions of them, sharp down, straight across, slight down, straight down. 
All right. Four. If 20 minus x is equal to 15, what is the value of 3x? OK, so we have some uh, just straight up algebra here. Um, but please note, it's asking us for 3x, not x. Negative x is equal to 15 minus negative 20. Negative 5, x is equal to 5. Um, hold on one second. Um, 20 minus x. Um, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So it's 5. And then, oh, so a is the answer. Oh, nay, nay. 15 is the answer. Boom roasted. By the way, so do you notice how that is always the answer when you have 3x or when you have like some value of it? The lowest answer is always the one where it's like, well, this is what the x value is if you forgot to multiply. That is very on purpose. Five. For the function f defined above, what is the value of f of one? Okay, so this is exactly what we were talking about in the other section, right? What, when it's asking you what is f of one, what it's really asking you is what is y when x is negative one? So negative one plus three divided by two, two over two, one, c is the answer. Pretty straightforward. All this is asking you to know is what do you do with f of negative one? All right, so six. Now, you can do this because this is the calculator section. Do not do attempt the strategy I am recommending on the no calc section. Like, please, please do not do that. Um, well, actually, so we'll, we'll cover. Um, so this is asking which of the following is equivalent. Oh, do you see the word equivalent? And you see variables up here and variables in the answer choice? We can just pick a value for x. If we so choose, we can just let x be 2 and do the math, right? So if we let x be 2, that would be 4 times 4 minus 12. Um, nope, minus 6. That's what happens. By the way, that's why you don't do mental math. Um, 4 times 4 minus 6. Um, 4 minus 6 is negative 2, so that if, if you let x be 2, that's negative 8. All right, well, um, if you take a look at 6, um, if we let x be 2, a would be negative 16, right? Um, basically, and then, like, you know, I'm not going to take you through the math here, but if you plugged it into all of them, one of them would give you the answer. Now, that will work. You can use your calculator, but... If it's question six, like odds are doing it that way with something with exponents is wildly unnecessary from a time perspective. So all we also need to do here is just, all this is asking us to do is distribute. So we have two X times X squared, two X to the third minus six X squared, D, right? So the equivalent, the plug-in strategy, like when I first looked at this, I was like, this is going to kind of be a nightmare just because we have all the exponential terms, just plugging in numbers when you have exponential terms just takes a while. Um, now there's plenty of questions later on in the test where that would be worth your time, where you wouldn't know necessarily how to do the algebra. And it's always an option if you don't know how to do the algebra. However, if you do know how to do the algebra, that tends to be easier. Um, faster. We'll go with faster. If you know how to do the algebra, it tends to be faster. Uh, any questions on anything we've covered on this section so far? Excellent. All right. Um, a retail company has 50 large stores located in different areas throughout the state. Um, a researcher for the company believes that employee job satisfaction varies greatly from store to store. Which of the following sampling methods is the most appropriate to estimate the proportion of all employees of the company? So it's all the employees of the company who are satisfied with their job. Okay. Um, Okay. 
All right, so this is a sampling question. Um, really, the core of most of these sampling questions is this concept. You know, we covered a bunch of stuff last week, but the core is usually this concept. You can only apply the results of a survey to the group that was randomly selected for. Um, if you ask people at a dog park a question, you can only apply it to people who go to dog parks. You can apply it to no one else. If you only ask people at one middle school, you cannot apply it to all middle schoolers, just that middle school. If you ask only the people in, you know, Mrs. Johnson's class at that middle school, you can't even apply it to the middle school. The group that you can apply it to is the, the only group you can apply it to is the group that the sample was collected from. That's generally what's going on in these. So even really before reading the answer choices, and we will go through the answer choices one by one, the, how would you sample this? Well, it's asking for um, which of the following sampling methods is most appropriate to estimate the proportion of all employees who are satisfied with their jobs. You'd have to randomly sample employees from all 50 stores. Well, actually, okay, we're not gonna get into the fact, we're not gonna get into the reasons why this question doesn't actually work, but we're gonna pretend that the SAT didn't like derp on this one. Um, we'll just run through them. But realistically, like what you would need to do is um, for the purposes of this, you sample employees at random from all 50 stores. So this says selecting one of the 50 stores at random and then surveying all, each employee at that store. Well, this is doing the wrong thing at random. This could be applied to the one store. It could not be applied to all the stores because we're only sampling from that one store. A, it's dead to us. Selecting 10 employees from each store at random, then surveying each employee selected. Yeah, that works. We're sampling every, um, we're sampling all of the employees at random. Um, and we're actually, you know, you know what, I'm not going to get into the hardcore statistics on that one. That would work for the purposes of what we're doing. We are making sure we have a sample from all the stores. We are randomly, we are randomly selecting from all the stores. That would work just fine. Um, by the way, my little rant about that is just because retail companies also have offices, not just stores. So if you wanted all the employees, that's just, that's just my little SAT rant. But um, for the purposes of this, that's going to be true. But let's take a look at C and D. Surveying the 25 highest paid employees and the 25 lowest paid employees. No, what? That is not referenced there. I think they're trying to make you like, Get, make this inference that like, oh, these will be the least satisfied people and these will be the most satisfied people. That is not an accurate assessment. Um, well, it might be accurate, but like we don't know it's accurate. Um, and then D, create a website on which employees can express their opinions and then use the first 50 opinions. No, this is not a random sample. This is a sample of the people who one, would volunteer to take a survey, and then two, would do it real fast. That is a very self-selecting group of people. Um, we have a question. Oh, sure, I can explain why it's me again. Um, so whenever you're dealing with a sampling question, more or less what they're getting at is um, you need to make sure the group from which you are randomly selecting people is um, the rather the group you are randomly selecting people from that is the biggest group to which that results to which those results could be um, applied right so we need to randomly select from um, we need to in this case it wants us to do all employees of the company so we need to randomly select from all the employees of the company, right? Well, you know, it's telling us there's 50 large stores. So somehow we need to randomly select from the 50 stores. Now there's two ways of doing it. Um, this one actually uses um, a weighted 
survey technique that's actually a little bit advanced and we don't need to get into it, but there's two ways you can do that. One, you pick employees at random um, from all the stores and just ask them. That's one way you could do it. Um, that is not what they said here. Or you can make sure you're getting some amount, um, an equal amount from each store. That would also do the trick. But we're randomly sampling from everyone. Um, you know, I feel like this is just confusing because I keep saying I'm not going to explain something. The reason why um, they're the reason why they're doing this is because, like, let's say you just randomly asked 500 people. Okay, well, you could accidentally end up with nothing but employees from four stores. It's very unlikely, but possible. Um, B would control for that possibility by making sure you get a distribution for all the stores. So maybe because maybe like one store, everyone hates the manager. Um, yeah, so that would control for that particular possibility. Um, making sure you get someone from every store. Um, yeah, so, but that's why it's B, because we need to make sure we are sampling from all the employees. And B is the one that gets us all the employees. Does that answer your question? Great. Um, moving right along. Um, the two graphs above show the total amounts. Uh, do we have another question? No, we do not. The two graphs shown above show the total amount of money that Ian and Jeremy have deposited into their savings account for the first seven weeks after they open their accounts. Um, all right, so we have these two lines. This can be a systems of equation. Let's see what's going on. After they made their initial deposits, how much more did Ian deposit each week than Jeremy? Um, okay, um, this is really just asking for the difference in the rate of change, right? Because what's the rate of change here? So their initial deposits, you know, that's 100 and 300. But how much more did Ian deposit each week? Well, how much they deposited each week is the rate of change, right? So what we need to do is we need to find the slopes and then subtract them. So um, what's the slope of, Jer of Ian? Well, Ian is depositing $100 every week, right? So it'd be 200 minus 100 over one minus zero. So that would just be, you know, $100. Now, how much is Jeremy depositing? Um, like, yeah, you could estimate that at 50, but let's just pick actual points. So this would be, um, the points we would use here would be 400 comma two and 300 comma zero. 400 minus 300 divided by two minus zero, which would give us 50. So um, then we would, what's the difference? Well, 100 minus 50 gets us back to 50. Huzzah. That's how you do that. All right, so the f um, number nine. Um, the function h is defined above. What is h of five minus h of three? Right, so do you see how they keep doing these function questions? Like really all you need to understand is let's just plug this. And we, all we need to do is take this value, plug it in for x, and we get our corresponding value. So really, this is just 2 to the fifth minus 2 to the third. Um, I don't necessarily know how good you guys are at mental math, but I encourage you to not get this question wrong by not doing two, by doing 2 to the fifth in your head. Just use your calculator. You have your calculator, I promise you. It'll take like four seconds. Um, it's time well spent. So I'm going to use my calculator to model appropriate test taking behavior. Um, two raised to the five is 32. Minus two to the third. Um, okay, I know that's eight, but again, modeling appropriate test taking behavior. That is eight. 
So 32 minus 8 is 24. Boom. By the way, so um, actually, while we're on this topic, they have been asking on the recent tests, they've asked this question like twice in the last year, but never before it. You're not going to see this question in the book. Um, so take this down in your notes. They have asked it twice pretty recently, and it's not that bad if you just remember this. Um, when you are graphing this line, what you need to remember is that um, it will never be zero, right? When x is zero, this graph is one, right? Because an two raised to the zero is one, not zero. So this graph starts here and exponentially increases. It does not start at zero, nor will it ever hit zero, um, nor will it ever, so like my line kind of little sloppily went past that, but nor will this ever be negative. There is no exponent that you can raise two to that you suddenly get a negative number. Um, they've asked you to understand that twice recently, so I thought it bears mentioning. Um, if you're watching this video online later, the year is currently 2021. Um, this might not be true in a few years. Um, so a researcher surveyed a random sample of students. Oh, another survey question. Excellent. Uh, a researcher surveyed a random sample of students from a large university about how often they see movies. Using the sample data. Oh, so and what's the largest group we can apply this to? Students at that one university. Using the sample data, the researcher estimated that 23% of the student population saw at least one movie. The margin of error for this estimation is 4%. Which of the following conclusions about all, which of the following conclusions is the most appropriate about all the students of the university based at the given margin of error? Well, first, let's just see, can we apply this to all the students at the university? Yes, we can because our random sample was students from the university. Couldn't apply it to other universities, but we can apply it to the kids at this university. Um, so that's fine. So the question has to really be about the margin of error. Um, so um, I know we covered this last time, but just a little refresher. Here's what the margin of error means. The margin, if you've ever heard, you know, it's 21%, you know, the politician has an approval rating of 21% plus or minus 4%. What that means is their actual approval rating can be um, anywhere between 17% and 25%. Um, margin of errors exist because you are not sampling the entire population. You're not asking everyone. So you're not going to get a completely representative number. The relationship between the margin of error and the relationship between the margin of error and the people you sample is how close you are to getting to actually asking every single person. The higher percentage of a group you survey, the lower the, the, lower the margin of error would be. Think about it like this. If I asked everyone at that university, I, my margin of error would be zero. I've asked everyone. <laughs> you know, um, if I ask two people at that university, my margin of error is going to be gigantic to the point where the survey is useless. I asked two people at a university. Um, the margin of error is um, inversely related to the amount of people you're actually surveying. Um, and now, so this, so that's how you get that margin of error. Now you're dealing with this 17 to 25%. Well, what does this mean? This means the number could be anywhere between those two numbers. 21% is not more likely than 17% or 25%. They are all equally plausible. Um, so let's just take um, let's just take a look at these and see which see what's going on. Um, so it is unlikely that less than 23% of students see a movie at least once per month. Um, no. No, in fact, it's actually pretty likely that less than 23%, um, but we don't know. 
we don't know how many, but that like below 23% has many possibilities. At least 23, oh, so this was 23%, sorry, my bad. Um, so that's between 28 and um, 18. So still, um, it is equally plausible there's less than more, at least 28, at least 23, but no more than 25. Absolutely not. That makes no sense whatsoever. Let's try this one more time. Reading is fundamental. Um, <laughs> 23 would give us 19 through 27. Um, this is, those are both still not true. The researcher is between 19 and 27% sure that most students see a movie at least once per month. Now, this one's being a little cute. It does use the 19 and the 27%, but that is not how sure he is. That 19 and 20% is how is not how sure he is about most students. It is that he is sure that between 19 and 20% see at least one movie. Um, they played a little game there that could get a little confusing. And then D, it is plausible that the percentage of students who see a movie at least once per month is between that and that. Yes, that is accurate. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes left in the class, so I'm going to jump ahead to some harder ones, just for those of you out there who want to see some harder ones. Um, however, does anyone have a question they would like me to go over in particular? Please speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, so I'm just going to keep moving. Um, so, um, all right, so let's take a look at 20. The maximum value of a set of data consisting of 25 positive integers is 84. Um, a new set of data consisting of 26 positive integers um, is created by including 96 in the original data set. Which of the following measures must be 12 greater for the new data set than for the original data set? Um, so this is actually just asking you to know mean, median, well, it doesn't ask you to know mode, but mean, median, mode, range, standard deviation. Mean is the average. Median is if you line them up in a row um, where the middle value is. Range is the greatest minus the least. And standard deviation is how clustered or spread the data is. So let's take a look at what's going on here. So the maximum value of the data set is 684. All right, so I see maximum value, and my brain just immediately starts screaming at me like range. <laughs> like we're dealing, we're we're dealing with the maximum value. Like okay, well then the biggest and the smallest are probably what's going to be affected. <laughs> um, a new data set consisting of twenty six is created to include ninety six. Yeah, okay, so we just changed the top value. Range has to be changing by the very definition of range. <laughs> So the answer there is C. Um, so the first year Eleanor raised, we're going to go to 22. The first year Eleanor organized a large fundraising event. She invited 30 people. All right, that's our initial value. For each of the next five years, she invited double the number of people she had. So please note, that is not 2x, that is an exponential growth, right? That is not a linear growth, that is an exponential growth. She kept inviting double. If f of n is the number of people she invited n years after she began organizing the event, which of the following best describes function f? Oh, cool, d. It's an increasing exponential function. Um, now, I happened to put that together as I was going along, but the key here is it says double the number of the previous year, 
right? That is compounding. You'd end up with 30, 60, 120, 240, so on and so forth. All right, exponential growth or decay. So here's the equation I want you guys to remember for exponential growth or decay. I'm not sure if we covered this last time, but I'm going to write it out again. Here's the deal with exponential growth or decay. Um, the new value is equal to the original value. I wildly underestimated how I wildly, there we go, move that over there, times one plus or minus the percent change. So, and what do I mean by percent change? Well, let's say it says it increased by 2%. That would become one plus 0.02. Um, raised to the compounding period. Now, what is the compounding period? Well, let's say they say, you know, it goes up 2% per year. Then this would be the number of years that that occurred. So now let's take a look at what's actually going on here. But this is the equation. I, if you haven't noticed, I'm a big fan of memorizing things in words. I find math formulas with just variables to be like deeply unhelpful in terms of actually memorizing something. Like, yeah, sure, if you're a math whiz, the shorthand is great. But, you know, for regular human beings, words tend to be easier. Um, Keith modeled the growth over several hundred years of a tree population by estimating the number of trees pollen of the trees pollen grains per square centimeter that were deposited each year within the layers of the lake sediment. He estimated there were 310 in the first year the grains were deposited. Ah, 310 is our initial value with a 1% annual increase in the number of grains thereafter. So now it doesn't try and make us think this is a line, but you see how it says 1% annual increase? Well, that means it's increasing off of whatever the 1% increase was the year before, thus exponential. So how do we represent a 1% increase? Well, that would be one plus the percent change. So one plus 0.01. Um, so yeah, that's just going to be D, um, but like for the, for the purposes of completion, let's just keep reading. Um, which of the following functions models PT, the number of pollen grains T years after it was deposited, right? So T years would be there. Um, this is the annual increase. So that's how we knew the compounding period. And it's just giving us years, by the way. So let's say it said each year and it asks us to model it based on months, right? And, and this is not like an idle musing, they've done this question. So let's say our, it's an annual increase and it's asking us for, you know, how many months, how would you model it in months? Um, then T would become M over 12 because the number of months divided by 12 is the same as the number of years. Um, yeah, if you ever see like a fraction in here where T is, that's how that occurred. The compounding period is in, is in a different measure of time than the, um, than the, the amount, the time they gave you. It's like a little unit conversion issue. All right, anyone have any questions? Anyone have a particular type of question they would like to go over, or I'll just keep picking. All right. Um, okay, so let's actually just take a look at 30. Um, so here's the deal with question 30. I looked at this, and the reason why I picked it is I went, I went oh, okay we have a geometry question where we have a shape that is like not really a shape. What can we do then? Well, let's break it down into shapes we actually can use. Great. So now we have, I'm going to zoom in on this. Now, so in quadrilateral ABCD, um, AD 
and BC are parallel. Cool. And CD is one half of AB. Ooh, I see what's going on. They're being real cute in this one. So, uh, so CD is one half of AB. So we know proportionately that this is going to be one half of this. So let's just call this 2x and we'll call this x, right? So now, well, like clearly there is something going on here where we can just break this into a, we can only say we're breaking it into a rectangle. We can't actually prove that that's a square, um, but we'll draw a straight line down here. It certainly looks like a square, but like it doesn't matter. Um, so now we have a square and a triangle. Okay, and a right triangle specifically. Those are shapes we can actually work with, right? Now, it's asking you what the measure of angle B is. So we need to know that full measure. Well, first things first, this is clearly greater than 90 degrees, right? Like I said, it's to scale. They're not to scale, but they're not going to be that misleading. Having this be 90 degrees would be so rude. Um, they're not going to do that to you. They're trying to trick you in other ways. So, well, if this is X, what do we know about this side? Well, we know that this side would also be X. So now we have a triangle where one side, where the shortest side is X and the hypotenuse is X to X rather, and it's a right triangle. Now, hopefully that's ringing some bells with some of you, but if it's not, that's okay. We just started. This is actually one of the special right triangles they give you at the start of the section. And despite the fact that they give it at the start of the section, you want to have it memorized. Why must you have this memorized? Because it being at the beginning of the section is not helpful when you need to recognize it in a question. Now, I understand that's question 30. It's going to be a hard one, but that's kind of how you get to, no, that's not kind of, that is how you get to the answer. So do you see here, this is that 30, 60, 90 triangle. Short side is X, long side is 2X, and the base is X root 3, right? Well, we don't really care about the sides, but what is relevant is the angle across from that X root 3 side is 60. Right? So here, this is our X root 3 side. So, well, that means that this is 60. And we know that this is 90 because we drew it as a rectangle. So combined, they will be 150. Um, and our answer is A, right? So what, what are the takeaways from that question? Well, one, just because you see a weird shape, don't get overwhelmed. They're never going to ask you to know some sort of bizarre shape. You can break them down into shapes that are easier. Rectangles, triangles, like things you actually have had to work with a bunch of times. Two, um, now this is something I have seen um, a lot of students have issues with. Um, do you see how like I just started drawing? Now I happen to like recognize where this was going, but if you had just started drawing in the portions, well, you could have ended up at this part where it was just like, you could have gotten to here just by filling in things that you know, right? Well, even if you didn't know what you were doing, simply seeing this could have jogged your memory, right? Very, very good test-taking skill on the math section. If you don't know what you're doing, like if you look at the question, you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Just start doing the things that you can do and see if it like sparks something. Because a lot of times it will. Um, now, like, you know, if you've spent 30 seconds on a question and you just have absolutely no idea, you know, cut your losses and move on with your life, but it's usually worth it to spend a little time doing what you can do to see if you can actually get to the answer. Um, so now, um, 
All right, we have two minutes left. All right, so let's just get one more in real quick. 29, the formula above can be used to approximate the height eight inch H in inches of an adult male based on length L, right? So that's height, that's the length of the femur. What is the meaning of 1.88? Ah, yes, I love it when, when I say lines up. Remember how I wanted you to read this? Um, 1.88 is the change in Y height per one um, inch, per, it's the change in his height per one inch femur, right? It is the change in Y per one X. 1.88 is the change in height per one, one inch of femur. It is the change in height per one inch of his femur. <laughs> Um, there is a lot to be confused in here. They phrase these really weirdly, but do you see how my strategy on how to conceptualize that, like, got you exactly to the answer? Um, like, it's almost word for word. There is a reason why I conceptualize it like that, and this is the question why. Um, your, like, we'll call it win percentage will go way up on that type of question if you learn it the way I taught you. Excellent. So it's 11.59. Um, our session is just about over. And uh, it's been a pleasure, and I will see you next week. Okay, so thanks for watching, and please remember to contact us at info at to set up any personalized private tutoring sessions you would like. Stay tuned for future videos, and best of luck with your studies. We definitely encourage you to visit our Instagram as well as TikTok pages if you have any questions along the way. Take care, guys. Best of luck with your studies.